Buenos dias, everybody. This is Gail coming at you from, uh, I don't know, I think it was L.A. last time I checked. Dr. K, are you there from London? Where are you at now? Yeah, here in uh, in very uh, cloudy London. Okay, and, I, and we even have Ross Haber. Ross, are you there or did you mute yourself? He's trying to slink I'm off. Okay, just say hi to everybody. Uh, some of you may know that Ross is now part of our team uh, for the new managed account program that we're setting up, and I know there's going to be some questions about it. Uh, but just to let you know right now, if you're on the email list, you're fine. Uh, we're getting things up and running. We'll let you know where we're at uh, when we get there and we're ready to go. So that's it on that. So no more questions on that, please. Let's get to the market. You can see the NASDAQ moving higher, making a higher high since the lows of early October or even actually since the break off the peak. Now remember last week I talked about the market, you know, a lot of people email you and they want to they want to fit every market period to some historical market period. And the bottom line is you can pretty much, you know, find several market periods if you're just looking at the, the chart pattern itself that you can fit to, but it's not it's not very meaningful in terms of predictive value. And I think people get carried away with it. And last week, you know, I talked about how 1994, this market looks a lot like 1994, in that you had this big break. Uh, off the peak way back then uh, in February and then you just chopped around for the rest of the year and you actually started a new bull market in 1995. Now the interesting parallel between 94 and today is that today we have the potential for the Republicans uh, and, and not that I'm not a Republican just so you know I'm a libertarian so personally I think Republicans and Democrats are just big government liberals but that's my opinion so please don't try and paint me into a corner as some right-wing nutcase uh, just because I can't stand Obama and the Democrats right now but I do think we need to add some balance because government in the too big a dose is not good for our general welfare as far as I'm concerned or the economy so I think there's potential uh, with the Republicans maybe adding some balance and taking over uh, one or two of the houses of Congress there's a similarity to 1994 in that the Republicans took control of Congress for the first time I believe it was in 42 years. I think the last time was sometime in 1952 or something like that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, Dr. K, if you remember those numbers. But that's the similar dynamic. And you've been in this choppy market, and you basically had all the bad news versus QE and the liquidity, all the liquidity that is out there and remains out there. I mean, there's so much liquidity that the ECB is pumping liquidity into the system, yet the institutions that are taking the liquidity turn right around and deposit it back with the ECB. Uh, so it's really not having the economic effects, but I think the situation with the market is telling you that it is driving asset prices, prices higher. And if uh, money printing is inflationary or devalues currencies, then you're going to see assets, uh, most assets, increase in price. I mean, what would you rather own, Apple shares or dollars, if the dollar starts to tank? So you can think of it in those terms. But the bottom line is you've got a, a move and a rally. And the NASDAQ here, you can see, is breaking at the new highs. And this is being confirmed, not, not new highs, but higher highs, by the S&P. And also, if you uh, look at the uh, New York Composite, that's a real broad index. It's above the 200-day now, and it's trying to come out. This is a broader market. But, you know, we've seen mostly a lot of NASDAQ stocks start to come on. The technology stocks are coming on. Uh, we have... <clears throat> Most notably, I mean, yesterday you had the socks going nuts, <clears throat> and if that isn't a socks party, I don't know what is. What? Uh, but you know, he got another day coming up again, and uh, this is kind of helping to to lead the market higher. Meanwhile, we've got gold, uh, which I view as as more or less uh, the uh, the barometer of QE is is holding above the 200-day moving average, and so far this is looking. Like it's trying to build a big double bottom. So you got these sort of pocket pivot moves yesterday in the, uh, not yesterday, but over the weekend. <clears throat> and yesterday, actually, in uh, gold futures above the tuna day, off the tuna day. So it's trying to act constructively. It's not really clear that uh, you know, it's necessarily going to hold up, but it is showing constructive action. Now, all this, of course, begs the question, Dr. K. What's up with the market direction model, and why aren't we at a buy signal yet? Well, this is a t pretty tough uh, stealth uh, bull market we're seeing here. Well, bull market, I should just say it's a trend. <clears throat> and it's been quite lackluster in terms of, uh, you know, up until, up until I'd say, really two days ago, it's just been a very questionable rally um, on low volume. 
and uh, it hasn't been there hasn't been enough buying pressure to put push the model into a buy signal. It also is taking into account that we're we've been in a very volatile trendless phase uh, since July of last year. So uh, the risk in moving out of the cash position is also at a higher level. So it's factoring that in and it's really what it's waiting for is more of a green light, um, more buying pressure or selling pressure to switch out of this cash position knowing that uh, the market is still in a very a fairly trendless and volatile phase. Now the last few weeks we've seen the market, uh, this has been a trend that has been probably the cleanest trend, although a weak trend, but clean nevertheless uh, since probably middle of last year. So that's also taken into account. And so as, in other words, as the market starts to clean itself up, uh, the risk in switching out of a cash position becomes less. So with all that, that's all to say basically that uh, there's a number of variables that the model weighs and it is looking to move out of its cash position when it sees sufficient buying or selling pressure. And that amount of selling pressure or buying pressure is lessening. The requirement is lessening uh, the more it sees this type of constructive action in the market. So that means that we may go on to a buy signal uh, sooner than later or later than sooner or? So sooner, I would say sooner than later. Um, you know, the also, the, there's another uh, factor involved and that is when the market tends to the overbought oversold factor is not something that we use. However, in a trendless environment, it does play a more important role. In other words, when the market tends to get ahead of itself, that overbought uh, tends to be a big warning flag. And the market right now is overbought. And because uh, I, we're not quite out of the woods yet in terms of what's happened all 2011, I mean, we, we've been rallying for a few weeks here, but that just that doesn't all of a sudden null and void what's, t what's taken place over the last year. So the market is kind of at a crossroads, uh, and the model, I should say, is at a crossroads where it's weighing all these variables and uh, it's basically sussing out when it can go onto a buy signal. I would imagine a buy signal would be the next signal as opposed to a sell signal simply because we're seeing more and more evidence of constructive action among leading stocks. Right, and, and you know, I'd also point out to everybody that we all we uh, look at the market as a market of stocks while we're also looking at it as a stock market with respect to the market direction model and even though the market direction model has been on neutral which you know I think is fine you know, a lot of people want to whine when you get a rally like this for a few days just like they whined after this one and then it rolled over but the bottom line is the purpose of the model is to catch intermediate to longer term trends not short trends of a couple of weeks so the bottom line here is that if this is indeed a new bull trend well where are you really in terms if you look at the queues I'm not going to go up the NASDAQ on a weekly <clears throat> Whoops, let's get up here. There we go. I mean, where are you really? If you're going to start a new leg to the upside, which is really what I think is going to be a profitable affair if that's what this is going to develop into, and I'm interested in, very much interested in something like that, you're going to break out to new highs and you're going to continue on an up leg, you know, as you did here and you continued higher. So as you're coming out of here, you know, you wouldn't whine here. If you caught this buy signal, you did okay last year. And we actually came into the market on September 1st. So there were four weeks of movement off the lows and you came to higher highs before the model went to a buy, but that was a great buy signal. And so here you are, one, two, three, four, five weeks off of this low, you're looking like you're starting to make new highs. If you went to a buy signal anywhere in here, you're not late. If you're late, it's really not that great of a, of a bull trend then. And that's what you're, really what you're looking for. We're looking for the window to open wide. Now, my experience, what I've been looking at, and my approach is to look at stocks in a variety of different ways. And you know, one of the things I used to love to do back in the days, uh, does, does anybody remember the old paper uh, printed daily graphs? Those green and blue books. Does anybody remember those? Let's see if we got any junkies who had those. Yeah, you know, I used to buy those. I used to drive all the way. I actually lived in Whittier at the time on the east side of LA with the rest of the poor people. Uh, and uh, I used to drive on Saturday morning uh, to get that thing at 8.30 or 9 o'clock when they opened to get those books right off the uh, the printing press. And uh, I'd love to smell the ink off of those. Even when I went to a new, I still got printed copies. Even though I think Dr. K never wasted his time with printed stuff. He was all electronic. But I used to get the chart books just to smell them. Do you remember those, Dr. K? Actually, uh, this traces all the way back to uh, 1990, uh, 1990. After I read Bill's book, I was in the stacks at UC Berkeley digging through old chart books, old daily graphs. Um, and my mom used to actually get those. I remember being eight years old, nine years old, and these daily graphs would come to the house. I wasn't looking at them then. I started actually yeah. looking looking at uh, these things a little later. But 
yeah, they're they're great to have. Actually, even today, I would say for people who don't have the time, um, you know, carry one of these uh, chart books around with you just to acclimate your eyes to what charts uh, should look like. Right, and and getting to my point, I used to flip through these. One thing I used to do is flip the corner of the book every week to make a little animated uh, show of, of the bottom right corner of the book. That's all a gift. But you'd look, you'd see all these chart patterns go brrr and flip by, and you'd see the trends, and you'd be moving up and down like waves as you're flipping through the charts. But when the market was turning, you'd start to see changes in that pattern, and and that to some extent illustrates the way I like to look at the market sometimes. And I will just flip through, scroll through the S&P 500. In the Nasdaq 100, uh, you try to screen out maybe the top 500 stocks, the biggest stocks in the Russell 2000, and just look at those and see how they're changing in real time. And the one thing I've noticed over the last couple of weeks is that you've seen or started to see a number of uh, these bottom fishing type uh, pocket pivots show up in stocks. And I pointed those out last week, and we saw a number of those uh, in stocks like. Uh, you know, Netflix coming off the lows, and I, and I know some of you saw this when it happened right here, and of course here it is continuing higher. You know, Soto is another one, and you had another pocket pivot here four days ago, and it's trying to come off uh, off the lows. Acom doing the same thing. There's a big bottom fishing pocket pivot. Uh, Amazon, which I own right now, and uh, bought three days ago right off the 20-day. Here's a, here's a mini pocket pivot right here. Uh, I believe it's barely noticeable, barely, but it's there. And so I'll try and pick this off. And, and here's the thinking here. Okay, here's your little bottom fishing pocket pivot. And if you're going to try and play some of these bottom fishing pocket pivots, because I know there's a few of you, I know this gets you going when you see this stuff off the bottom. But it's doable, and especially when you're in a sort of a market environment that Dr. Ken and I like to call the straight up from the bottom junk market, a lot of the movement in stocks comes in things off the lows. And we observed a lot of that in 2009. So here we are, probably starting another QE wave. Is what it looks like, or it's feeling like. We'll see how it continues to pan out. But a lot of these stocks are showing these pocket pivots. So I see, you know, tons of stocks doing this, and I could just keep going on with them. I need to get back to Amazon a second, but there's Roby. If you remember Roby Corp, um, I think I showed you Acom, uh, and, and there's just several. Of these. Even I think Green Mountain is trying to do that. You get a little. Here's pocket pivots coming up to the. You know, right off the 10-day here. Now it's above the 50-day uh, here. Did it get above the 50-day? Let's see, 50.91, and it closed at uh, just underneath. But you can see how you're seeing this action. So in other words, the selling has kind of exhausted itself, it feels like. So on that basis, you're seeing these things start to turn. Everybody wants to get short. And uh, I used to joke when I was at IBD, or not at IBD, but at William O'Neill and Company, and I, after we wrote the book, uh, how to make money selling stocks short that we should gauge the sales of that thing uh, during a bear market because when the sales spiked up that's what usually the bottom and I, I haven't really checked the numbers because I don't have access to them but it'd be interesting because a lot of people seem to be very interested in short selling you know a couple of weeks ago I mean I was too to some extent but you could start to see that the setups weren't really there and things were turning to the upside but if we look at Amazon here on a weekly chart and this is something to incorporate. I think trying to add a couple of other reasons for a bottom or potential reasons for a bottom uh, to a bottom fishing pocket pivot because they are they are less risky. But one of the things I try to combine is the macro picture. So in Amazon, we had this double top signal, and that was a sell signal. And it broke down. The stock went down about 32%. Now, we know most leading stocks will pull back about 30%, 35%. And so... Uh, this is pretty much a normal correction. Now, do you think Amazon is a doggy company that's now going to decline like Research in Motion has, and, and it's over and it's going to $10? Somehow, I don't think so. So my view is that you have one, here's one leg down, two legs down, three legs down, so that you get the three waves down and selling, and now it's ready to turn. So it's back above the 50-day, and today you are seeing another it may develop into a pocket pivot up to the 50-day, but you're running up close to some resistance here. So I'm getting ready. I bought this thing down here, big size. I'll have a two, three hundred percent position. So if it runs up three, four percent in one day, I'm going to be making anywhere from uh, nine to twelve percent uh, in my portfolio with that position. But I, you know, I'm watching it here as it approaches first the 65-day exponential, but I think it could get to the 200-day, and then you might see it rally after earnings because you're seeing a lot of stocks. Jacking after earnings, F5, a Bible gap up. We told you about this this morning, and if you're in it right there, you're probably up on the stock right now. You're using a little low at 116.49 as your stop. 
So that's looking good. So you're seeing here's another example of another constructive uh, movement in the stock. And a lot of times you know, these things are rounding out the bottoms or coming up the right sides of bases and they're showing this sort of viable uh, technical action. And it's telling you, I think, what's going on underneath uh, the hood here. And I think that means that uh, the market is steadily improving and uh, and we'll, we'll see the model go to a buy signal when it's right for it to go to a buy signal. No, no sooner, no later, I'm sure. But in the meantime, uh, you know, I'm giving some love on these uh, long positions that I've been taking, uh, and they're working. So, and not necessarily, you know, Amazon off the lows was a good one. Last week, I told you guys about uh, CF. I'm watching it right now. I tried buying some a little while ago, but sold it out at a tiny profit just because it's sort of faltering. I'm looking for it to hit the 10-day on a pullback, similar to what it did here. It doesn't have to get there. But remember last week I told you about this right about here, about 163, 164 we were at during the webinar. You can go back and check that if you want. And by the end of the day, we're jacking up to 172. <clears throat> we hit 175, you hit re resistance. So what I do is if I'm trading this in big size, I just flip it here and look to buy back. It could have kept going. And if it had broken out, maybe I would have chased it up a little bit uh, to see if it could continue through 180. But you know, that's a sharp move, so it may just go sideways for a period of time. So I'm kind of watching it. I got it up on my screen here, but I don't own it. So actually, maybe I should get it out of here and put it on my watch list. You can see I have a very complex uh, quote screen. <clears throat> yeah, right. You should see Dr. K's. Dr. K's looks like something from outer space, but in any case. <laughs> Uh, where are we? Oh, I want to make one, uh, one remark about one word of caution about uh, playing um, junk off the bottom that's rounding yeah, here's out. Here's one. Here's a pocket uh, pivot off the bottom, Dr. K. You don't like research in motion here? <clears throat> well, one word of caution that is uh, if, the, if it's rounded out and the patterns you've been showing have sound uh, roundings off the yeah. lows and so are, are very playable, but first of all, a lot of those stocks are only going to be playable on a swing trade basis. They might not keep right. going. The second right. thing is do not hold those types of stocks through earnings because like the, the chances are they've already had a gap down or two on bad right. news. Usually bad news uh, precedes bad news, precedes more bad news. So uh, do not ever hold one of these through uh, earnings. Now a stock like F5 on the other hand, that's already traced out its base or a price line. It's traced out its base um, and it looks like these are going to be heading higher. So they're not junk off the bottom types of stocks. Right. And in terms of those holding for earnings, it's uh, at your discretion. Right, and that's a good point. And I just want to point out also, you, you know, you're seeing what I'm talking about, and uh, I'm trading these guys. Uh, you know, it, it, at point, points, I'm buying them where I think they're going to catch uh, support, and then puking them out at resistance, particularly if they're deep in the patterns. But you know, you can play some of these, and when they start to work, that tells me that the market is starting to percolate underneath. Uh, all of all of the madness, okay, and all of the bad news. And you got to you got to admit the news is pretty bad. You know, everybody getting downgraded. So I'm just going to run through my quote screen so you guys can see what I'm looking at. Obviously, Amazon continues to move higher. Like I said, I own it from down here. I don't necessarily think you can buy it up here. It's riskier. But I'm looking to see how it gets to this resistance here. If it continues to the 65-day exponential, that's my first point of resistance. I'm see this is the 202 level. I think they come out with earnings. Uh, what do they come out with earnings? Uh, end of uh, actually 127 is that right next is that next uh, Thursday or something like that along with Apple yeah uh, next Friday yeah anyways uh, you know Sox has been leading and interesting point about the Sox that some people will make is that you know is it is it is giving you uh, an idea of the un, un, overall or undertone of the market's health you know uh, and with the Sox jamming the way it has been. Well, let's let's look at the SOXX. This is the one X ETF. If you want, if you really like uh, juice, um, you can go with the two times uh, ETF, the Sox L. But you know, with this moving, uh, semiconductors are moving, but you don't see a lot of really quality names in the group. You know, there's things moving up off the bottom. Um, one one that we were looking at that looked pretty interesting is par parametric technology coming up through the. Uh, 200 day right here, and when you look at the pattern, I don't like the scaling on this. I like the way uh, O'Neill charts scale this better. Let me scrunch it down so it doesn't look so weird. But yeah, it's trying to come up, and this might be one that works. But you know, we were already on to the strength of semiconductors with another semiconductor that we told you all to buy uh, on the pocket pivot here. And, and you know, at the time, that kind of looked like it was way up there, running from 10 to 11. Uh, but you know, 
what's often too high uh, can get a lot higher. And you notice how this turkey just does not want to pull back. My guess is it's just going to hold pretty tight in here. And if it closes up around here uh, by the end of the week and near the highs of the week, now what you may, may have is a uh, the so-called, uh, what is the thing called again, Dr. K, that, that, pa that new pattern uh, that we that Bill made up after we had RIM uh, back in 2003 or four, I think, when Hammer was it called? Uh, uh, You're talking help about me out, uh, people. A tight, a tight, uh, tight squeeze. No. Uh, a high, uh, tight flag. <laughs> it's a musical. It's got a, sh a short, a short stroke. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Short oh, okay. stroke. Yeah, I don't know where Bill got that term. I, said, I don't. Oh, I, no, I, I see all these labels. Me these labels, joke, they, they these labels. Uh, and it's, I'm thinking just. You, you, people shouldn't get too attached to these labels. No, I know, and, and we used to joke about where did Bill pick that one. He said it was a musical term. Yeah, right. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's go. Let's see. Let's go through this just so I can get to some questions because there are a lot of questions coming through today. All right, but in, in vision, yeah, that's what I'm looking at. So, you know, viral pharma. You know, this thing, you know, I think this illustrates why you have to stay with stocks. You have two breakouts and new highs. One here, one here. The rule of three at work, you, the third one works, and it's a pocket pivot. We told you guys about it, and uh, stock has gone higher. You're pulling back. If this thing pulled back below 30, I'm going to park uh, back up my little red wagon, beep, beep, and, uh, and load, the, load the wagon up here. It's a smaller stock, so you really only need a, a wagon to have a big position in it. So stuff like Amazon, you have to back up the truck. But uh, Viral Pharma, small stock. So it's actually acting the way it should. So I think you just pull back. The volume's kind of drying up, and you'll get some sellers. The way this thing acts, a lot of times during the day, it can show some initial strength, and then it pulls back. And you, if you've been watching it or owned it for the last couple of days, you know what I'm talking about. It'll go go out and go in, and, and uh, it's kind of thin. You get a few sellers, the buyers back away, and let them knock it down 20, 30, 40 cents. They'll come and turn around. So you're kind of looking for that pattern to, to maintain itself here. And I think that uh, that's... Uh, Probably how this will pan out. So I'm just looking for a pullback to, to really load into this thing right now. Uh, TibX is a very interesting situation. Now we see, you know, CRM is going nuts, Salesforce is going nuts. I wouldn't buy that though. VMware is also doing pretty well. Uh, you know, these are, the patterns are, are interesting here, but they're really, there's nothing there you can really buy. But what I notice here on TibX is, uh, you had this break here on earnings, and you actually found out on earnings that things aren't so bad for this company. They are a cloud company. And a couple of things. Uh, some might say this looks like a pod. You know, it's a late stage fail base, and yeah, it is. But the thing is, the market is uh, starting to act constructively, and stocks tend to uh, consolidate uh, in the direction of the general market trend. So you see these things like CRM that was looking like a short and fossils was kind of like a short. Well, they didn't really work out that way. They all turned uh, the other way on us. And uh, and that's because you get into a bull market. So the way these patterns often will pan out depends on what the general market is doing. But what I'm looking at here is this is a big supporting week off the lows. And you might consider that in this pattern, you have one, two, three ways of selling overall in the pattern. So to some extent, You've worn out all the sellers. You had big buying here, but I think this buying was when that cloud computing ETF got launched and they had the load into positions here. But here you have big buying off the lows, and notice all the very tight closes. So if we go back to the daily, so if I'm seeing stocks coming down, and a lot of times I'm looking for three waves in the weekly patterns, and I'm seeing them come down, they're still fundamentally reasonably sound. Uh, then I'll I'll look at the the technical action on the weekly. And so you notice with TIBX you're getting some tightness in here on the weekly. But here's the daily now. And you're noticing uh, you can barely see the pink line. That's the 10-day. The green line is the 20-day. But what I'm watching for here is a potential pocket pivot coming out of this range because I think then you trade up at least towards the 50-day uh, uh, up in the 24-25 range. And then possibly you can continue higher. These guys already announced earnings a couple, three weeks ago and the stock uh, you know, did this. So you kind of got that out of the way. And if the cloud group comes on, then I might expect that you're going to see uh, TIBX uh, moving higher. And I bought that this morning, I have to tell you. So uh, the other one that we're looking at that we own is Monster. It used to be Hansen's. My friend Doug Hansen and his son Hans Hansen are probably very upset about that. But uh, my younger brother, who's an absolute monster beverage freak, and I believe there is a gene for it because his two sons who are teenagers wear monster t-shirts wherever they go. 
So these guys obviously know how to market. At least they have trapped the minds of my nephews and my younger brother. But uh, you have a Bible gap up here. Now notice you have a pocket pivot right here on Friday last week, and then you have a Bible gap up, and you're holding a low here. But you know, Monster, if you look at the pattern, it's a little bit of a squirrely stock. And so our approach, the way we're handling this position, and Dr. K and I both own this, and the way we're handling we're using the low of this day, which is 99.25 plus 2%. So that almost takes you back to the low of the gap up, which is 97 and change right here, 97.14. So you really, you know, if you think about it, that's only 3 4% away. So this is actually a really good spot to buy this, but Monster is a little bit of a funky stock. Dr. K, you have any comments on this? Well, you know, I, I like uh, seeing this kind of pattern where you had a constructive base. Uh, Mo Monster just wouldn't uh, get taken down with the rest of the market. Um, ever, I mean, it's just it's so resilient. And then you have yeah. a Bible gap up situation. It's a it's a beautiful pattern. It's probably my favorite stock out there right now. Yeah, and I and you know it's going through the hundred price level for the first time in its history. So of course you know some of you and Thorn that was a, you know you picked that up right away, Thorn. Although I think you overthought it uh, in terms of it being you know you could instill the the century mark rule. I remember uh, Livermore's whole thing with the century mark rule was you buy a stock when it goes through. Uh, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, whatever for the first time and that usually a stock should go through those levels and move higher very quickly. Now the thing is that's not really statistical proven out. Maybe that was the case back in Livermore's day but a lot of times what I noticed having studied several of these and we go back and look at you know Netflix I think at 300, Apple at uh, 400, at 200, uh, Lulu I think at 100 at one time but they took a few days in most cases and so what I know is they come up to that big market it seems to serve as short-term resistance in this market you know maybe there's a bunch of algos out there that are selling the, the, the moves up into the round number but I don't know but it does seem to me that they can take a little bit of time so I, what, I, you, what I wouldn't do here is I wouldn't even worry about the so-called Livermore century mark rule that I've talked about and that you can read about in uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, the book that all of you should have read by now, hope, and if you haven't, you should definitely read that book. That is, in my view, the number one book to read on the market. Followed Mine by as Andy well. Uh, share the same yeah. sentiment there. It is the best. Yeah. And we are followers of Livermore, O'Neill, and also Wyckoff, who was the first guy to chronicle Livermore. So we like to call ourselves the Owls, O-W-L, O'Neill, Wyckoff, Livermore. Um, and uh, <clears throat> you know, the owls are wise and all this other stuff. Um, owls on the prowl. Owls on the prowl, and they know when to wait and swoop down and scoop up their prey at the right time. So we like that analogy. But in any case, we consider ourselves uh, derivatives or der our, our methods derived from the OWL or owl uh, ethos, which is the mentality of these guys, Livermore, O'Neill, and Wyckoff, which is very commonsensical. Uh, but this guy's a little slow, you know, he tries to go higher and it sells off a little bit, but we, we like to suck and it goes higher. So you hold this, you know, I would actually hold it, it could pull down into the gap and I would probably use that as myself, that's what we're doing right now. So F5, of course, we told you that's a Bible gap up. Uh, Netflix, you know, the, the pocket pivot here, and you actually could even look at a, this big one through the 65 day, sometimes those work, but I think what's really key here is you have a sharp move off the lows, you hold very tight and you start to move higher again with a pickup on volume yesterday, so it's acting okay. Ancestry.com. Uh, I thought about going on to that service, but you know, I don't know. In my case, it might be better to not know who my ancestors are. Uh, <laughs> you know, so in any case, um, Ancestry.com. Yeah, it was like Ross and Dr. K were joking with me earlier. They said, "So, Gil, how many uh, how many uh, members are you going to insult on the webinar today?" <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'm, I haven't gotten to the questions yet. Just let me get to the questions, okay? Uh, Fio, Fusion IO is, uh, hmm. here's a little, I don't know, bottom fishing pocket pivot coming in here. I don't know. It's like trying to round out, but it's like everything else, you know, acting okay. But I always watch Fio. I love the technology. and I think Steve Wozniak is really the genius behind Apple. I mean, everybody talks about Steve Jobs, but Steve Wozniak, I think, a much smarter guy. Uh, but that's just my opinion, you know. Steve isn't dead yet, so nobody loves him. <clears throat> Steve Steve Wozniak. Um, anyways, uh, soda. You know this thing, same thing. Pocket pivot. You could have bought it. You'd be up a little bit here on it. Um, 
Rax is one I'm keeping an eye on. Ross actually likes this one. He thinks it's setting up to go higher. And of course, he's got this cup with handle. And I tend to agree with him. It looks like it's coming up. So keep an eye on this one. If you get a pocket pivot in here, you need to ex ex uh, exceed this volume here, which is uh, 2.677 million shares. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, but it looks, uh, you know, it's trying to come out of here. So, and, and the base looks okay. So, you know, you're seeing that. And there's a number of those in, uh, in the market. Uh, getting back to see if we talked about that. Qcore, uh, you know, I played that trade. You guys remember last week I was buying it around 35. I played that trade up for a couple of days and now I'm out. But I'm watching this very closely because uh, it's pulling in. And I got to tell you, I think this, this streetsweeper.com blog or whatever, these guys are slime balls. I don't care what any, whether they're correct or Qcore is doing something illicit. But these guys are slime balls. They go out there and they tell everyone they're going to write a two part article detailing uh, compliance violations by Quest Core, but without offering any details. Okay, then the next thing you know is oh, the, they're going to do an interview with Quest Core, and Quest Core published that interview. You can go online and read it. And they ask a bunch of questions, none of which strike me as uh, being uh, indicative of any kind of a uh, of, of fraud or, or non-compliance or just, you know, uh, BS from the company, and and I think you know these guys going short eighty thousand shares first. They still have not given anybody any reasons why the company is committing fraud or or doing something illegal. They have not cited any facts. Okay, yet they still come out. Yesterday the stock was trading above thirty eight. It came off real hard, uh, and that was actually my signal. I was using thirty eight as a trailing stop on there, and I just dumped it right there. So I may come back to it again. And I like the way it's pulling in here. It looks okay. Uh, but these guys then yesterday come out and say that they're going to release the article immediately, ASAP. And the headlines actually say that. And then nothing happens. And they say, oh, well, now we're going to release the article later because we have some new facts, some new facts we've come up with, new information. Well, come on. Where's the SEC? This is a pile of crap as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, whether these guys are doing anything wrong or not, I don't know. But I think you buy the stock in here if it's pulling down. Uh, and, and you can use a low of today maybe as your as your stock in you know, real quick on this, but I, my guess is they're these guys are going to come out with the series nothing, and then it's going to this thing's going to bump to the upside. So um, there is risk here, you know, if these guys do have something, but so far their behavior uh, is very suspect. And you know they came out with their announcement on this day, knocked it down, and according to Jeffrey, these guys covered half of their position on this day right here. <laughs> so uh, SEC, where are you? You know, yeah. Obama wants to put all kinds of bureaucrats out there. Where the hell is the SEC on this one? Especially if you, you own the stock. But, you know, you should have been out of it here or even on this break. I had some shares, and I unloaded them when it couldn't hold this uh, pocket pivot here because it should have moved higher. But I think, you know, if you're crafting, you like to try and uh, bet on something like this because to some extent that's what it is. Uh, it's, it's possible to do. So, you know what? Hey, Billy, you out there? Why don't you pick us up some shares? Let's see here. I kind of like the way this thing is trading. It looks like a low risk trade. Hmm. Check out our buying power and let me know what's going on there. Anyways, uh, moving down. Let's see. Socks LCRM. LinkedIn. Here's another one. A little bit. This is a mini bottom fish pocket pivot up to the 50 day right here. And of course, it's moving higher. So there's another one. Uh, VMware coming off the lows. I'm not buying it, but I'm watching. Uh, I like TibX. And you notice as I'm talking, I, it's probably you guys running out and buying it. Uh, it's pushing higher. So, uh, I, we, parametric tech talked about that, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, but you know, Envision to me is is one of the stronger new uh, pieces of merchandise out there. Uh, SD Lauder, this is one Ross likes as well, and uh, you had to like this tightness in here. You know, got on the weekly chart here. Notice how you get these tight closing are starting to come out. Retail stocks have acted okay, not too shabby actually. Um, <clears throat> Everybody give me just one second. I'm just checking on something real quick. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, tractor supply. Here's a big viable gap up. Of course, it's a lot like Monster. It's kind of going nowhere. Um, this guy's a great company. You know, we have, uh, for those of you who know Fred Richards, Fred always likes to Every time I see him, he's, oh, so my tractor supply made a new high. Oh, 
you know, I, I should sell it, but my cost basis of 0. 0.00012 cents is, you know, just too low for me to want to pay those taxes. <clears throat> he makes me sick, but uh, Fred can hold them, let me tell you. Uh, Netflix going higher. Let's look at the big stocks. You know, Amazon continue to move higher. It's acting well. I'm still along the thing. Priceline, you have the pocket pivot, and it came up through the 50-day. Uh, we actually debated this one for a while because we thought about putting it on a couple days and you know just just confirming the strength in here. So to us, we're actually you'd be watching for a breakout on this thing if you're going to buy it. I don't think you're going to get a pullback. Earnings come out next week. So uh, moving down the list, uh, Google's been knocked around. But it seems to be holding the 50-day big Nasdaq stock. Oracle got knocked down; it's come back to fill the gap. Um, Apple continues to make new highs. It looks a lot like it did back then. It came up to a high, the high of the base, and then paused for a couple of days, and then continued higher. I think gapped up on earnings. Um, and now here we are, same thing. You come to the top of the base, pull back for a few days, now moving to new highs. I don't know if it continues, but I'm not really comfortable buying Apple here. Uh, there are plenty of other things I think that are working as well or better. So, <clears throat> see here. Intuitive Surgical, they come out with earnings after the close, but all this did is pull back to the top of this base now it's up. So if you own it and you're up on it, you got to decide what you're going to do in earnings. Dr. K, let's say you bought a position on our pocket pivot somewhere in here whenever we told everyone about it. Let's say I think it was right here, maybe. And you own it. What would you do going into earnings? Depends on my position size and my risk tolerance levels. Uh, I mean, essentially, uh, earnings. Let's say, you're, are, let's say you have a fifty percent position. Well, that to be. Let's say you're me and you're maniac. Most investors, that's a, that's a pretty big position, and I would probably <laughs> turn it down. But uh, you know, if that if that represents not a big position for for an investor. Then you know, hold it in their earnings, knowing though that the stock could, any time the stock can gap down fifty percent on you, you know, on a dis disappointing earnings report. So factor that in and see if you uh, see if you're fine with that. Um, of course, not that that will, you know, that's a, obviously a rare instance that would happen, and uh, the stock could actually more likely gap up, especially it's, if it's been acting right and isn't an uptrend. So you know, weigh those odds. Uh, the odds are probably in your favor to hold their earnings, and the stock will be just fine. But also keep in mind that this is a this last 12 months have been completely treacherous, and there have been a lot of stocks that have gotten gotten uh, taken out of the shed and shot, uh, even if they uh, beat estimates, just because they might have guided lower. So always know your downside with it going into earnings. <clears throat> okay, good enough. Let's see. Continue down. Baidu has been weak. Chinese stocks have been a little bit weak. I noticed so Netties has been acting a lot better. Uh, and getting it's in a base, but you know these aren't really where the action is. I think it's mostly in some of these other stocks that we've been talking about. And mostly what you're seeing on this list of stocks here is what I like the most. And uh, there's been some profitable moves in most of these. So there are a lot of things in viable positions. So uh, let's see. You know, morning. interesting. Is, uh, I was looking at Street Sweepers just now, and uh, they they do uh, disclose all their short positions, and they say that they often will go short. Um, a stock before they issue the report, but then that begs the question: If they have a big following and they can manipulate the price by issuing a report, and they right. have a, a short position, then doesn't that? Um, I mean, it, it's kind of like free money for them. Although I suppose if they keep doing things like Questcore, then they're going to lose their following very quickly, and as well as their influence. Yeah, it reminds me of that guy, an us, Anunzio, Scanunzi, or whatever the heck his name. The guy who was on CNBC shorting. Oh yeah, with Netflix. Netflix. Yeah, and we got up on Market Watch, and you know we talked about it. And I remember people slamming us and saying that we're, you know, we're just uh, defending our position, even though we didn't have a position. So, uh, but it was just yeah, based on the price on volume. Thing, he was uh, he was going after that stock uh, well before its peak, and then yeah. I kind of wonder if he uh, managed to get any of the downside when the stock did finally peak. Yeah, probably not. He's a lot like that other guy. But in any case, um, all right, let's go to some questions. You kind of got our view on the market and what some stocks look like. Uh, price action has been good in pocket pivots and some leading stocks, but volume has been mediocre with most. What's your experience as to what this signals? Pocket pivots or pocket pivots, just buy them. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really trying to measure the magnitude of the volume. How about you, Dr. Kim? 
Well, I think you just uh, take a look at the bigger picture um, in terms of how strong the general market is acting. So for a year like 2011, there weren't too many pockets of strength in the general market. So I would limit your position size and exposure on the long side anyway um, yeah. to the market. Now, right now, the market has been finally shaping up. We're finally transitioning into a, a healthier environment. So you might uh, buy uh, more normal size positions, but still, I would keep I would keep your exposure to the uh, general market on the long side, uh, still on a limited basis, because uh, as I said, I don't, I don't think we're quite out of the woods yet. Yeah. Um, somebody asking, uh, with Biogen will form three weeks tighter to close around this area on Friday. Do you wait for pocket cover by the 3WT base? If you're waiting for a pocket pivot, there's nothing to wait for because you had one yesterday. Uh, if you want to buy on the basis of the pocket pivot, then of course you want to scale your position. Uh, you know, if you bought on this pocket pivot, which we told you about, then uh, you get another little pocket pivot here off the 10-day, roughly. Uh, you know, that's that's viable there. So, you know, you could buy, you could add your position. Is the PLXS uh, a viable gap up? Uh, it's got those characteristics, but it's plexus. It's a Electronic uh, negative earnings growth. So it's not a leader. We, we don't really care for these if they're not leaders. Correct, Dr. K? Exactly. Pick the best. Dr. K, does your mother trade? Yeah, she, uh, she does. She's, well, she, these days she's uh, really focused on other things, but um, she used to be a very avid trader. In fact, in the 70s, I remember being five years old and writing down prices uh, along with ticker symbols and not knowing what I was writing, I was just watching for them, watching right. for the price movement. <laughs> uh, some names, PAY, I don't know, I, I don't understand why you would buy that one, there's no real reason to buy it. Uh, TSCO, we looked at that, that's a uh, viable gap up, let's go through the short stroke, short stroke, let's see. In the past, have turnaround situations gone on to be a big winner in spite of weak EPS ratings? Uh, a lot of moves moving into homes. I I would I don't care for the home builders. I don't think you need to own home builders. I think that's kind of the where everybody's going right now. But there you're not seeing the earnings in these things just yet, so it doesn't really hit our radar screen. You're still seeing like Toll Brothers negative seventy percent earnings growth. So you know if they are a turnaround, then uh, they need more turning around. I remember in 1994, IBM was a turnaround story, and that stock actually did uh, very well. Uh, during that period, so I think let's see if we can go to IBM and look at that. Although that's going to be '94, man, that's going way back. Let's see if that works. Um, it's interesting. IBM was a ten bagger from uh, 19 from its low in '93 till uh, well, its peak. It was actually a 14 bagger. I don't know if I can get that far. Where am I? '97. Okay, here it comes. Here it comes. 95. Yeah, here's 94. So here's a low, and you can see from the low in 293, and it really went nuts in 94 and had a big move. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, they can have big moves, um, very nice big moves. So, not a problem. You don't don't try to overthink things. You know, I think some of the questions indicate a, a lot. There's a lot of people out there who just want to like think and think and think, and, and you know, you get a bias and you go with it. If I see something I like, it's acting okay. I buy it. I don't need to get into 500 uh, conversations with myself about what it, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? What is this lighter volume? Then you know, sometimes things move higher on just a little pocket pivot volume, and that's it. And that's all you need to see. You don't. It doesn't necessarily have to be 50 percent higher than uh, average. And that's pretty much the whole intent of the pocket pivot. Uh, move is that there are very subtle buy points that occur when uh, it's really not uh, <clears throat> not that obvious to the crowd. You know, so here you have a pocket pivot right there on Friday in MNST, and you could say, "Oh, that didn't come on a heavy volume." Well, if you understand pocket pivots, you know, you shouldn't even be asking us if is the volume not sufficient if it's below average. It doesn't have to be below, above average; it just has to be higher. And that's the whole point of the pocket pivot. Nobody sees it. So it's not, you know, it's not like, uh, what does this mean, you know? It means you're seeing pocket pivots, and there's a lot of them, and that's probably good for the underlying market, and it could be signaling the start of a trend just as it did in early September, late August of 2010. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at. So so getting back to, you know, don't care for uh, builders. 
<clears throat> Do you like builders, Dr. K? Just okay. not yet. <clears throat> is that guy on uh, The Simpsons who dresses up like a bee? No me gusta. All right. <laughs> Can you describe how you buy on pullbacks? What do you mean, how you buy them? Your stock pulls back to a 10 day or something, and it looks like the volume's drying up inch a day, you just buy it. It's like it's not like you're going through some big process. You know, for a while, I consult the my astrologer, and then I call my mother, and then uh, you know I, I put my left foot in and my left foot out, and do the hokey pokey, and turn myself about, and then I buy it. How's that? You know, it, it's like people. It's not that complicated. It's not that complicated. You get a buy signal, it starts to work. You go with it. You know, if you if your stock hits resistance, you you see a spot where it might be viable on a pullback, and it comes to that point, and the volume's turn up, you buy it. You know, there's no exact point; it might pull back another percent or two before uh, it turns around and goes higher. So you know, this is not that detail. And when things work, you know, it, it gets real simple. That's what we notice. So right now, it's been a very simple matter to buy some of these stocks and make some nice profits pretty quickly. But uh, Juniper just that's not really. What we like, I don't know. I don't really like that. It, it may is this a pocket pivot? The next day you trade more volume, so not really very good. Does it bother you that the RS line on MNST is not at new highs, Doctor K? Well, that's a, that that is an important indicator, but it's not uh, the only indicator. There's so many other indicators that weigh into the picture. So of course, ideally, you want to see the RS line making new highs, um, and so that would be a minor flaw in this pattern. But it's more than outweighed by all the good things going on in this pattern. And yeah. Stock. And the other aspect here is that you look at the relative strength line. Uh, it's not shown here, but it's a 97, so it's it's pretty much right at the all-time highs. So it's it's roughly uh, moving. But there's a lot of things. The reason probably this relative strength line is lagging slightly. In MNST is uh, because you have a lot of other stocks jacking up off the bottom very sharply. And you've seen stocks like, of course, Amazon. We're looking at Apple, Priceline. So there's a lot of things jacking off the lows, and they will tend to take uh, in the relative strength uh, away from other stocks that are acting just fine. Okay, and I think that's really the issue. So I, again, you know, there's contextual. Uh, Issues here that have to be taken into account. Um, Solar Winds is acting okay. Yeah, I'm watching for a pocket pivot up through the 50 day. But you can almost see this one coming because it runs up, pulls back, and now it's turning around. There's really been no change, I think, with the company. So it's acting okay. Um, PDG, we already talked about FIO there, but you know, that's that's hanging out in the base. I guess you just watch for a pocket pivot or a breakout or a buy point in there. So I, I love the question though. Uh, are these pocket pivots in the making? I don't know. Let me consult my my uh, crystal ball. I don't see if they're pocket pivots in the making. You know, I don't think they really pocket pivots work that way. Uh, do they, Doctor K? I, I mean, do we look at pocket pivots in the making? Do you have a screen for pocket pivots in the making? Yeah, my future screen, not future. You know, I got a pocket pivot screen, but I don't have a pocket pivots in the making. It's like, hello, come in, come in. <clears throat> Anyways, Jess. All right, guys, how many members have I insulted so far? So, Ross, are you keeping track? Uh, okay, Jazz, Bible Gap up. We talked about that. Nice pullback. They completed a buyout. I love yesterday. They halted the stock. Okay. So if you were long the stock yesterday, uh, you know you get to have a little bit of uh, cardiac arrest, wondering what's going on. There was some talk of Pfizer maybe buying them out, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, they just... Show that they closed the buyout of another smaller company, and so stock turned around. Volume is decent. Now you're pulling in. It's light volume. The thing is, you come straight up off the bottom. My guess is you're going to need to go sideways. So I just kind of watch how this acts along the 10-day. Maybe you get a pocket pivot or something in here. Uh, you got anything to offer, uh, add here, Dr. K? No, it's just uh, pretty much uh, <laughs> just sit tight if you got the position. It's not doing anything wrong. And uh, yeah. you know this tight, tight sideways consolidation is obviously constructive, and uh, may very well issue another pocket pivot in the days ahead. Yeah. Let's look at uh, SPPI. People asking about. I mean, it's you know you had a pocket pivot here, you pull back to the 10-day, gets a little bit of volume. It's a thin, small stock, so it's slow. You know, I'd rather own this right now, and uh, it's pulling down towards 30. So we'll see what happens here. But so far, everything looks normal there. Uh, let's see here. More questions. We only got about ten minutes, so I want to get 
through what I can as quickly as I can. EXP, we talked about that as having a, a pocket pivot and it's a breakout, new high breakout. Um, you know, I notice if you know Priceline is acting well, Expedia is acting well, and you have uh, you know even travels you have this bottom fish type pocket pivot. But you know if you have a choice between this and Expedia, you would want to buy Expedia since it's breaking out, and you would want to buy Priceline. But I think it tells you it's a good an underlying tone uh, in these stocks, so it looks okay. AKRX, Dr. K, didn't you put that up as a pocket pivot today? Yeah, good yesterday indeed. his little pocket pivot. Yeah, his little pocket pivot pulls in. But again, you know these are thin stocks. They tend to be a little squirrely. It's like SPPI. Uh, you know, I'm surprised this Envision has not really been very squirrely, which I think is uh, is a good sign. But if I'm going to buy a biotech, you know, think about quality as being consistent with uh, uh, with price or being correlated to price. And so, in the case of uh, you know, let, let, let's look at some of these. Okay, everybody gets excited about this. Eh, but it doesn't really move. Okay, everybody gets excited about. Is it this one? What was the name of that one again? AKRX. But yeah, it's like eh, whatever. But it really, the ones that are moving, you got Viral Farmers acting well. As we go up in price, we see Alexion continues to act well. I talked about that uh, this one last week when it was pulling down into the 10 day. It's potentially addable in there. We got a position, uh, and it's acting fine. Goes up on higher volumes. Seems to pull back on lighter volumes. Seems to act just fine. Uh, and then you look at Biogen, you know, which ha is up around 100 bucks, 116, 117. It's building a base and comes out with earnings. So, you know, I, I know a lot of times people get all excited and they want to buy stocks like this because it's cheap and they can buy a lot of shares. But the reality is, the quality and price seem to correlate to some extent, and you will see that play out in the market. And I think you see it in the biotechs because you see some of these other guys, you know, SLX, excuse me, XLX. Uh, P. Salix Pharmaceuticals pulling into the 10-day. This looks viable on this pullback. I like it here. Um, let's see some of the other ones. Cubist. That's a reminds me of P Picasso. Uh, this is pulling back right to the top of the base, but it never broke out in any volume. So I don't know. A little iffy, but you know these are a little bit uh, higher quality, probably because of the price. But when I see a breakout in Alexion, I'd rather buy that than a breakout in this. If all other things are equal, based on price. Okay. Somebody wants us to look at the GTLS chart, the gutless chart. What is that? Oh, chart industries. Uh, it's a thin stock, so it doesn't hit my radar screen. How about, uh, Dr. K, you got anything to say on this? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting, but uh, not not enough, not so much that it's uh, worth a report just yet. It's got some good fundamentals behind it, good uh, earnings and sales acceleration to be sure. Institutional sponsorship keeps growing, so it's got a lot of good tailwinds on its side. But uh, well, first of all, I just um, it's it's one worth keeping an eye on, but it is it is on the thinner side. Right. Uh, with you guys in IBD recommending INVN, could we all be making the market for it? Well, I don't know who you know. Uh, I I don't I, I haven't really read IBD recommending anything because they don't recommend anything. They just identify positive characteristics in stock, just like we do. And in our case, you know, in Vision, we identified the viable pocket pivot right here. And we have had nothing else to say other than that. So I don't really care who's pushing it up or if we're making the market. All we know is we got into this turkey here, and it's up 30% up from there. So uh, does it matter? And do we need to think about it? Uh, does that mean you sell now? I mean, this is an example of overthinking. The other thing is you don't really understand that IBD doesn't make recommendations, and neither do we. We simply identify positive characteristics, and so we're not running around telling everyone to buy the stock up here. We told you to buy it down here, so we're not running around saying recommending this thing up here and telling everyone you got to buy it. We just identified a buy point here. If you bought it and you own it, well, you own it, and it's up. Who cares who's buying it or why? Doctor, do you have any comments on that? I'm sure you do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, as, as you said, don't overthink because uh, you know the market's challenging enough. Um, keeping things simple, but no simpler. That's really a, a very key. A spot as a as an investor that we all need to find. We need to find that simple spot so that we can analyze many charts and make good constructive decisions without getting bogged down in minutia and unnecessary detail. Yeah, that's going to be a chapter in our new book: overthink and the death of traders. <clears throat> What's the easiest way to find out earnings dates for all the stocks on your watch list? Uh, Briefing.com is pretty easy. You can just type in your symbol and it'll give you a rundown. Uh, it brings up a new. Uh, Page, uh, well, in my case, I use Explorer. Please don't shoot me, Dr. K. 
uh, by Easy Explorer and it brings up a new window when you type in the symbol in the search feature and that at the top will show you the date of the next expected earnings announcement. If you want to spend some money, you can, uh, you know, I think uh, Daily Graphs will have it on there, but it's usually an estimated date. I prefer to use briefing.com. Um, and also, briefing.com, during e earnings season, you can get a whole list of uh, companies and you know, the day they're going to announce earnings uh, and see everything that's going on. This tip class, as we're looking at this, is acting pretty well. You guys must all be running it up. Um, BA has signed a lot of huge contracts. This is a good entry point. Um, Okay, now this is, I find this interesting. We haven't put out anything in terms of pocket pivots or anything on Boeing. Uh, and you really haven't seen any pocket pivots in the stock. You know, is this one? I don't know. So, you know, is this a good entry point? I don't know. I don't really care for the stock. Can you explain a bit more what you need to see for a nice rounding up of a base? <clears throat> uh, Dr. K, you got any comments on this one? Uh, oh, what, that's that's pull, kind pull of a nice those. rounding like that. Looks, yeah. looks like a baby's bottom. That's kind of kind of out of you. Uh, you see, you even have a little. Never mind. Um, but you know, I don't know. It's constructive and tied in there along the lows, and it's not. Uh, it's it's not going straight down and straight back up. It's rounding out, and then it makes its move. Right. It takes a number of weeks to do that. So yeah, Netflix is quite ideal for that. Maybe this question is for you. This next one. I'm currently 60% invested on the long side. Would you consider that too aggressive, given that the market model is still in neutral? Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm currently like 350% invested on the long side. So I think it's all relative. If you're up on your positions and you're doing well uh, with them, and they're all giving you love, so to speak, then I think you're okay. What do you think, Dr. Well, yeah, I always go back to is this the, guy uh, too aggressive. Is April. I also the April. April uh, to, uh, April 1996 example where the model was on neutral because uh, the market was going sideways but enough leading stocks were breaking out. Uh, I didn't have pocket pivots back then but enough breakouts, quality breakouts were happening so I started buying up those stocks. didn't matter that my model was on neutral. Uh, the model really is designed for capturing uh, intermediate term trends in the market, the, the general market, so that would mean ETFs, not stocks. Yeah. Dr. Kenny, psychological tips on holding winners? Well, don't get greedy. <laughs> Always uh, pay attention, uh, you know, near the top, uh, because uh, the the stock might give you uh, an, an excellent exit point uh, off the peak, such as a high volume reversal uh, or a climax top pattern. Uh, but really, greed, greed is a very important uh, aspect because I think all too often people get uh, wedded to their positions because they have uh, such a nice profit in them, and they fail to see the warning signs when the stock inevitably does top or has a uh, an obvious sell point where you might want to reduce your position size by at least half. Now, basically, follow your rules, you know, and, and leave leave your mental gains out of it, and that's the best psychology. Somebody's asking us about CDI, Dr. K. Is that a dog or what? I don't. We don't like the oil stuff. I mean, they, some of them look look okay. You know, we've looked at this, and of course, it pulls back, and you could buy it, but. We think uh, they're not so stable. Do you recommend using MarketSmith? We don't use it, so. I can't really recommend it, but you know, I think first and foremost, if you follow O'Neill, then uh, why not use O'Neill tools? Where can I buy a crystal ball? Uh, go online; they have them all over the place. I actually, friends love to send me a crystal ball. I have, you know, as a joke, gag gift or whatever, and I have way too many crystal balls. But they're they're all I know is that. that's the problem. They're not working because you got to you got to find the best one and use that. <laughs> Right, and certain balls you never want to be made of crystal, but we won't get into that. Uh, short strokes, yes, I've sent the kids to the other room. Good. We maybe we should have uh, a warning at the beginning of these webinars. You know, uh, this is uh, con uh, mature content. Uh, Thirteen. You know, use discretion. <laughs> I'm crying inside. Somebody says, I don't know what that means. Melee, melee. It is a melee. I don't, I don't know. This stock's all over the place. I, I don't know. I don't really like it. What do you think? you like it, Dr. King? Not enough, no. I mean, it's good that it had that gap up earlier in uh, in November, but it needs to complete its pattern here before I'm going to get more interested. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even on the week, it doesn't really look all that great. It needs to tighten up. So. What criteria do you use in screening to find pocket pivots? I mean, what are the criteria for pocket pivots? Cores. We talked about that already uh, on the site. 
you know, put it up as a buy uh, yesterday. Was that right? Two days ago. Two days ago. We, uh, two days ago as a pocket pivot. It's coming up through 28 roughly up in here, and, and uh, it's gone higher. So uh, it's up. So it's, it's working so far. It might pull back. So, but that's okay. Where to add to BPHN? Well, you know, you're looking for another buy point, or I, I think under 30, I, I would nibble here on this pullback, and that's kind of what I'm working on. I'm letting my little human algo, Bill Griffith, uh, step in and accumulate shares, you know, and then uh, buy in the making. What's this? Buy in the making. My real time screen shows pocket pivots as stock volume maintains. P that's good. Uh, you know, you can be creative with that. So I basically, what I do uh, on eSignal, and you can see that I've got it. So, for example, uh, I'm watching TibX, and you can see the little, I don't even see this, but there's a little H here, and I have a volume alert set. So set alert here, and then volume. And I have the volume typed in, which is, this is the highest down volume over the prior 10 trading days. So when the stock hits that volume level, I get my alert. Now, sometimes stock you know, is a little higher than it might be early in the day, but everybody always wants to get an early start on pocket pivots. I don't, you don't really need to. They're just early entry points to start building your position. <clears throat> but that's one thing I do to just alert myself. I'm watching things. Um, Lulu's acting okay. Remember, you're straight up off the bottom to new highs. you got some overhead resistance in the pattern. So it makes a lot, you know, in fact, if I squish this down, you, know, you can see it comes straight up off the bottom. You're going to build a handle here. That's what it looks like. But so far, so good. Um, AL, air leasing is, is pretty good. We put out a pocket pivot on this, didn't we, Dr. K? Uh, you had a pocket pivot here. I believe we did. Yeah, that's right. We, yeah, uh, it's totally tight. Trades, it's kind of one of these uh, small, you know, trades 463,000 trades just barely makes it onto my screens. <clears throat> but it's one of these things that uh, go fool you because they're nice and slow and steady and air leasing sounds really boring. I already talked about gold earlier. Somebody's asking about that and this whole thing about the 200 day moving average. It could be a big double bottom. What you can do if you want to, if you're a trend line follower, you can just draw a big trend line here and uh, you can see how, you know, once it breaks to that, maybe you got a buy signal. So I'm kind of watching that. I'm also watching for pocket pivots, but like I pointed out at the beginning of this webinar, whoops, let's see here. <clears throat> Gold futures, and Dr. K and I were actually watching this Sunday night, I think it was Sunday night or Monday, I forget, I think Monday, uh, which was like a Sunday night with the markets closed in the U.S., but you have gold uh, futures actually exhibiting a little bit of pocket pivot type action both of these days off the tune of day. So that's a little constructive. Maybe it's a clue that uh, gold has made a double bottom is going to slowly work its way up. So we're just watching for the first buy signal. We don't own it. And we don't need to. We're just waiting because you're waiting for the next big move. So I'm just waiting for Stuart to, to ask me uh, you didn't like gold when we last talked, and it's higher. Are you prepared to admit you're wrong? It's like, I think Stuart has issues, but uh, that's just my own opinion. INVN is on the leaderboard list. Okay, well, that's nice. But I don't know if there's that a recommendation. If we are not, you look for another pullback. I'm, I'm looking maybe if it formed like a little short stroke type pattern, you know, that might be viable this week. Um, you know, I own it. I'm holding it. Maybe you should switch to chicken bones. I'm not quite sure what that's about. Oh, Africa. South Africa. African. <laughs> chicken bones, more effective than crystal balls. Oh, yeah, there you go. The bones, the bones say. Um, hmm. Caterpillar, a sign of strength. You got 11 out of, uh, up 12 out of 15, excuse me, up 12 out of 15 days or better on the chart here. So looking for a pullback here. But, you know, it's that a strength. And I think you even had a little pocket pivot in here somewhere probably, I don't know. But it's acting okay, I'm not a buyer. Uh, Nuon continues to go higher. Uh, glad you asked about that one actually, and it, it's acting fine, but I noticed, keep an eye on Netgear. Uh, all right, I don't know what's happening here to uh, my e-signal. There we go, everybody still there? Yeah, you there Dr. K? All right, sir. I sure am. Okay, Netgear is uh, trying to come out of this low handle. It looks like it's pocketing or trying to form a pocket pivot today coming up out here on a breakout. Yesterday, you came off the 10-day, but no real 
uh, move there. So let's take a let me shrink this guy. What the heck? It's kind of weird looking. But you know, it's, it's trying to act better. Scrunch it down there. There we go. Um, so it's for you know, cup and handle here coming out of the handle, trying to. And I think you even have a little bit of a pocket pivot here off the uh, 50 day right there. So it's acting okay. It's still within viable range, you know, if you want to buy it. Um, in a breakout like F5 today, would you normally take full position or take a position and add as the stock moves up? Dr. K? Yeah, it all depends on your uh, your style. Um, it's a factor of uh, also how how forceful the gap up is and how strong the market conditions are. Uh, I guess a good example is when the the market is in a strong bullish phase and a quality stock has a gap up. You're better off just buying it right at the open because it's probably going to continue a little bit higher for uh, during the rest of the trading day. Um, yeah. Also, I've noticed that if it doesn't, if it go if it has a pullback after the gap up. That's often a buy point in a strong environment because it'll buying will just step right in and push it back up, so you can get get, uh, get nibbles um, at a lower price. Right. So you know it really it's contextual to the market environment again, and also your own um, risk uh, management yeah. principles. Yeah. Somebody's asking. Here's this old thing. You know, late stage base. Uh, is that something to consider? You know, I think forget about the whole BS about late stage bases. I mean, they're they're late stage when they're late stage and they fail. This thing is run up. You had three ways of selling in the base. You can see that one, two, three, and you undercut the lows of this base. You know, and you get everybody nice and shaken out. You get big support here at the lows of the base coming up. I mean, just buy the viable gap up and then work it from there. You know, why, again, why do you need to worry about whether it's a late stage base? I, I think people can be scared away from stocks because of this late stage thing, and statistically, it does not pan out. Right, Doctor K? Uh, exactly. I, I've never, I've never found a late stage base is reliable. It's a, it's no, a really, it's an absolutely minor component at best. Yeah, and and just a lot of these uh, silly things like that that really aren't relevant, you know. Uh, but anyways, that's our opinion. Anyways, that's uh, that's what's going on, everybody. So you can see where we're at. The situation is evolving, evolving here. Things look positive. Uh, there's some progress to be made on the upside. You do have to be somewhat steadfast and not scared out too easily, but I think it's easy to see that the short side was played out last week, and a lot of these patterns, you could basically see how patterns kind of fell off our radar screen because they didn't pan out. And when the last couple of things we're looking at were Fossil and Salesforce, and of course those are you know off the screen, uh, off our screens now, but you know they were showing that uh, stocks didn't really want to uh, break down and uh, and. Accordingly, uh, we see uh, constructive action, a lot of these bottom fishing pocket pivots, and uh, we're seeing the market turn, so it's acting better. So we may get a buy signal on the model soon. And other than that, things look okay right now. Right, Dr. K, you agree? Uh, yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. That's pretty much sums yeah. it up. And we'll yeah. just uh, you know be vigilant as always. Uh, and yeah. when, we, when we do get that change in signal, we'll send out that report. Yeah, and we've already got things we're looking at on the buy side. You know, so proceed with caution, but proceed. So that's it, you guys. Thanks for showing up, and we'll catch you next time, all right? Take care. See you, everyone.